turn to the Gospel of John and just chapter 3 and just let it sit there in your lap. That'll be the first scripture we'll go to this morning. This word uh, that God gave me is something specific and something timely for the hour we're in. Buckle up. God, I just thank you, Father, and I, I worship you, and I just need you this morning. I need your grace. I need you to relay the word how you spoke it to me, God. And, uh, Lord, we live in serious times. We live in uh, trying times, and, Lord, you've not called your children or your church to be ignorant. You've called them to be watchful and to listen and to depend on you. And God, I just ask for great grace this morning to deliver your word. And I just pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. The title of the message is What's Shaking Christ Church Should Be Shaking You. What's Shaking Christ Church Should Be Shaking You. Now, if you didn't hear, this week there was a there was a murder of 50 people in, in Christchurch, New Zealand, and it was it was perpetrated by a, a demon-filled, hate-filled racist. You know, he goes over there and he kills 50 people, just demonic. And uh, I believe the Holy Spirit has something to say to us, as He always has. In events that come in our time, the Holy Spirit and the Word of God is never quiet. It's never silent. God always has something to say to His church. He always has a word for His church so they would be in the know and they would be wary and they'd be aware of the times that they live in. And as I was reading the news the right when it happened about the shooting and I was thinking as Christians, we don't need to speculate. It's not necessary for us to speculate where the souls are going. When souls go into eternity, I don't need to speculate about where they're going or where they're going to heaven and hell. But what I do need to do is I need to pray for God to have mercy, for God to reveal himself for those involved. For God to show himself in a powerful way and bring healing when there needs to be healing and reveal more of himself to those that are involved, that he bring mercy and truth. You know, something so heinous and so wicked perpetrated by a demoniac, there's just a magnitude of hate and violence that just boils on the surface of this earth right now. If you read the news, if you watch the news, if you're on social media, you hear it. You hear all the hate and all the vicious speaking and all the racism and all the division and all the finger pointing. And what is God saying to his church in a time that's unprecedented, a time that there hasn't been so much unrest? It's like a powder keg and it's waiting to go off and everybody's dancing around the powder keg, lighting matches and holding candles. And we're waiting for something to happen. In every media outlet that I read, when something terrible happens and something heinous happens, you know how it always begins? They always come with their sympathies and sorrow. We have so much compassion for those that happen, but really you know what they're gearing up to do. They're gearing up to spin it. They're not truly filled with sorrow. They don't truly care. They're not truly on their knees crying out and praying, Oh God, have mercy. Oh God, help these people. Oh God, send people into the harvest. Speak life and speak healing to these people. Send Christians that are in your word. That's not that's not the heart of the media or social media. They immediately begin to spin it after a few days. And the same hate and the same finger pointing begins to happen all over again. And they begin to place blame and point fingers and it begins to start all over again. Prejudices and judgment become to come to the surface again. How it all began. And they want to beat each other and beat others with their own bent and views and pursuits. You know, when I saw this happen, it, it impacted me because I felt like I could hear the Holy Ghost screaming out to the church. Are you awake yet? Do you hear yet? 
Is there enough violence for you yet? And God talking to his church and saying, you're my hands and feet on the earth. I'm not going to appear and do it for you. I put myself in you so that you would do it. I sent my Holy Spirit. And I told you it would be better if I went away. Because greater things you would do in me. And I'd give you the same power. The same spirit that raised up Jesus Christ from the dead is the same spirit that lives in you. And yet, as Christians, we hold our head down and how do I get through this problem? How do I get through this issue? How will I get through this problem? God, can you ever meet me in the place I'm at? I've done the same thing. I'm not pointing fingers at anyone. I do it too. I hang my head. Oh, God, help me. I'll never get through this dilemma. This mountain's just too high. And then you read that scripture that says the same spirit that lives in you is the spirit that raised Jesus Christ from the dead. All power in heaven and earth I give unto you. Those are amazing, powerful words. You know, the headline today in some of the papers I was reading early this morning, I couldn't sleep. So I got up 3 o'clock in the morning and I just couldn't sleep. And this word was brewing in my heart. And <clears throat> many papers said, now we know that the shooter acted alone. No, he did not act alone. Every demon inside of him and all the hordes of hell are confirming that I know he didn't act alone. It was perpetrated by darkness, by evil, wickedness. And many are looking to blame everything and everyone other than this man. Everything and everyone other than the sin and the wickedness. Sin and wickedness. People used to ask me, what's the worst thing you ever saw as a police officer? I got this question all the time. What's the most heinous thing you've ever seen? And I'd look them right in the eye and say, sin. Sin. It's always sin. It's always some sort of sin. That's the most wicked, heinous thing I see. It's always sin. It's always the springboard of sin. And God never rejoices over the death of his creation. God doesn't sit in the sky and be like, well, there's another wicked one that just bit the dust. He's sitting there interceding and praying, even though he knows the future, not willing that any should perish, but they would come to repentance. I've made a way for you. I've made a way out for you. I've made a path for you. I've illuminated it for you. Walk in it. Receive it. It's not his heart, and it shouldn't be the heart of Christians. It should be nothing but compassion and mercy. Oh, God, I don't care what they believed. It was another soul. It was a soul that needed you. He destroyed the earth once because of violence, didn't he? He looked at the earth and said, it's filled with violence. And the intents and their hearts and minds are constantly evil against me. And he destroyed the earth with water. And he said, second time I'll destroy it with fire. In 2 Peter 3, 9, I need you to listen. Listen to this verse. In 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 9, it says, The Lord is not slack concerning his promise. As some men count slackness. But he's long suffering. He's not willing that any should perish. But that all should repent. Did you hear me? He's long suffering. He doesn't want any to perish. But he wants all to repent. To bow the knee before him and repent. You're in John chapter 3, right? Look down at John chapter 3 and go to verse 15. John chapter 3, verse 15. And whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have eternal life. And then John 3, 16 says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. And Christians love to stop there. But every time I read my Bible, it's never stopped there. He says in verse 17, For God sent His Son into the world not to condemn the world, but through Him it might be saved. And wouldn't you know it, the Holy Spirit keeps speaking. And He believes on Him is not condemned. But he that doesn't believe 
is condemned already because he's not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. And he comes and he says, this is the condemnation, that there was light that came in the world. Jesus Christ came into the world and men loved darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. And he says, for everyone that does evil hates light. They don't come to the light lest their deeds would be reproved or in some translations exposed by light. And Jesus is saying, he's saying, I didn't come to point the finger and condemn. I came to reach out my hand and pull you out of the muck and the mire and the quicksand you're in. That's why I came. But many and most will not reach out and grab my hand because they love their darkness. And I don't have to condemn them because they're already condemned. They won't reach out and take the hand. I know that when they're training you in rescue, in water rescue, and somebody's drowning, you don't immediately grab hold of them because the first thing they do is they grab a hold of you and push you under so they can survive. And I took a water rescue class, and you know what was one of the things they taught me? Sometimes you just have to wait for the fight to go out of them and then grab them by the hair and drag them in. God is so compassionate and merciful, sometimes he waits for the fight to go out of people. Right? He is such a gentleman and merciful. All the batting the air and the fighting and the running after the world. And then when you hit rock bottom, man, that hand looks really good reaching down to you, doesn't it? But there are some that won't do it. You see, they're of their father, the devil. Jesus looked at many. He said, you're of your father, the devil. And the deeds of your father is what you do. And there are some on this earth that they practice evil. They continue in evil. We see them living in darkness. They run from the light like cockroaches. And this atrocity is committed by demons in the heart and demons in the mind. You think this popped up? No, this was in his heart for years. It was vile wickedness in this man's heart growing and metastasizing and feeding hate and vengeance and demons speaking to him. Brooding. And it's the same with people in the world. There's manifold millions that have wickedness in their heart. And what's God saying? He's saying, repent. Just repent. Reach out and take the hand I gave you. Repent. You know, and the church is so complicit because the church is so lazy. So fat and comfortable and dozing all the time. It's like we're hands off. Well, I don't get my hands dirty. I don't want to offend anybody. I don't want to say that I have a standard. I don't want to push anybody away. Well, why don't you push them away from hell? Stand up and speak the truth. Because you know what? There's a worm that will come in your conscience and won't go away. You live in sin and somebody speaks truth to you. Guess what? It keeps you up at night. You start thinking about what that person says. They spoke truth to you and it doesn't go away because truth doesn't die. Amen. Truth doesn't die. Jesus said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life and it doesn't go away. Truth will always triumph over a lie. Here, there, in the air, it's going to triumph over a lie. And all will know and all will hear. You know, I'll tell you, there is this mindset and there's this growing unrest in our world, and it's darkness. The Bible says that in the last days, there'll be lovers of themselves, there'll be rebellious, haters of parents, despisers of good, inventors of evil, proud, haughty, all these things. And never before have we seen all these things come before our eyes. And we're sitting there going, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. This is the time it was talking about in the Word, isn't it? This is exactly that time. And it says that they'll call evil good and good evil. And here we are scratching our head going, that's wickedness. Why are they calling it good? A guy can't be a girl. What in the world? You're calling good evil and evil good. The Bible doesn't say that that's true. The Bible says the opposite. It says in these type of times, they will call darkness light. And they'll be like a bunch of blind men in a room groping for a door, trying to tell everybody how enlightened they are. That's the time we live in. And we pick up our word and we read it and we say, oh God, here we are. And as I saw this happen, 
I was, God, I was preparing a different sermon and God's saying, I have something to say. I'm trying to speak to my church. Nobody's listening. Did you know that there was 120, 130 Christians slaughtered this week in Nigeria? Systematically, they went from church to church, shot them, or burned them alive. You see that in the news? You don't see it in the news? God is screaming to his church, and he's speaking to his church. And here we are in a time... And surely God has a word. I am a firm believer that the word of God and God is never silent. He's never silent. And I'll tell you what, even in his silence that we think is silence, he'll be speaking. He'll be speaking to you. He doesn't leave his people without a vision, without a word. Why would he put in his Bible that said, without a vision, the people perish, if he's not willing to continually give them a vision? Because he already said he's not willing that anyone would perish, right? He's continually speaking to his church, and he's speaking to his people. And God never leaves his people without direction, without vision. Let me share with you the truth and the teaching that Jesus was speaking to the masses. And this is the first scripture that popped into my mind. This week as I saw this wickedness and I saw the wickedness in the world. This is the verse that came to my mind and naturally applies to us. And when Jesus was speaking this, he was speaking to disciples. He was speaking to the unsaved Gentile. He was speaking to he was speaking to future apostles. He was speaking to followers. He was speaking to a large gamut of people, all the way from unsaved, all the way to future apostles. And this is what Jesus says. Turn to Luke chapter thirteen. Luke chapter thirteen. I believe this is what God is saying. This is what God is saying to our generation. This is what God is saying to the church right now. Turn to Luke chapter thirteen. And in Luke chapter 13, look there. Go to verse 2. In Luke 13, 2, Jesus answers and he says to them, Do you suppose that these Galileans were sinners above all Galileans because they suffered these things? So I tell you, no. Except you repent, you will likewise perish. And he says, on those 18 upon which the, the Tower of Siloam fell and it killed them, do you think that they were sinners above all other people in Jerusalem? He says, I tell you no. But if you don't repent, you likewise will perish. And I feel that echoing in my heart from the Lord. Saying, you see these heinous acts happening? You see the violence? You see the wickedness? You think it's being perpetrated on just really terrible people? No. God's saying, no, but unless you repent in the spirit, you will perish in the spirit just like these people. You too will die. You too, America, will die if you don't repent. You think just all these wicked and horrible things are happening to people because they were terrible people? He says, no, but if you don't repent and if you don't change and if you don't get right with me and if you don't get on your knees and if you don't take this serious, you'll die too. You're going to die. You know, never before has the church been so full of games and so full of lack of seriousness and lack of direction and lack of taking his word at what it says. It's no secret that I don't agree with the teachings of Islam. It's no secret that I believe that everything the Muslim teaches is heresy and I don't agree with it. It's not a secret because no true Christian would ever believe it. But no true Christian ever rejoices in the death of anyone. No true Christian ever rejoices at a soul. We cry, we mourn, we hope God save them, God speak to them, God do a miracle, God bring healing, God comfort them, God reveal yourself to them. If you rejoice over something like that, you're not a Christian. You're not. You
You know, you should be praying for those families, praying for those in need, and praying for the ones here that are in need. Healing. That those that are in darkness would have light. Because never before have we lived in such darkness. 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 Gross darkness. In hell it says there will be a darkness that can be felt. It will be so dark you will be able to touch it. And you know what sin is? You know what the, the exceeding sinfulness of sin is? It's a foretaste of that place. It's a little taste of what's to come for those that go to hell. Torment. Sin doesn't give you pleasure. Sin will come and hook you. It'll thrill you and kill you. It'll come and entice you and then assassinate you. That's what sin does. And that's what we read about. You know, and there you are in Luke chapter 13. And Jesus goes on and he says, until unless you repent, you likewise will perish. And then he goes on and he says, I'm going to give you an example. I'm going to give you a parable. He said, a certain man had a fig tree planted in his vineyard. And he came and he sought fruit on it and he didn't find any. And he said to the dresser of the vineyard, he said, behold, for three years I've been coming and looking for fruit on this fig tree and I can't find any. Cut it down. Why is it wasting my soil? Cut it down. And he answered and he said, Lord, let it alone for one more year. He said, I'll dig it and I'll fertilize it and I'll tend it and I'll water it one more year. And then if it doesn't bear fruit, then you can cut it down. Isn't it amazing how God follows up with this example? After he says, if you don't repent, you'll die. If you don't repent, you'll perish. And then he gives an example of someone who's not repenting. Someone who's not bearing fruit. And then somebody comes and intercedes and says, just wait. Don't, don't kill it yet. Don't cut it down yet. God have mercy on our nation just a little bit longer. God, have mercy on your church just a little bit longer. Have mercy on these sinners I know just a little bit longer. God, let me dig in. Let me pray. Let me fertilize this soil. Let me dig in. Let me speak into their life. Let me trust you a little bit longer for what you want to do. It's powerful. Because now it's the same for our nation. It's the same for so many that you know. The keeper of this vineyard, he's surveying those around him and he's crying out God wait God wait wait just a little bit longer let me pray let me fast let me sacrifice let me see if anything can be done and I believe that's where we are as a nation I believe that's where we are as a church for people in our community God wait God just let me pray let me fast let me trust you a little bit longer I look at the earth, how much more violence has to go on? How much more hate? You know, there's murder in people's hearts. You watch the news, you listen to debates, you listen to this person on this side, this person on this side of the aisle. There's nothing but murder in their heart for one another. Hate. Just hate. And as a church, as a body of Christ, we're the ones that have to stand up and say, just a little bit longer. Just wait. And God is also saying, you repent. And I was thinking about this word going, God, aren't I preaching to the choir? Why would I be telling a bunch of people that love you to repent? You know, there are things in your life that are lax. There's things in your life there's compromise. There's things in your life that God has called you to come up higher and you've dug your heels in. There's places that God has asked you to go and there's things that God has asked you to do and you haven't done them. You know, I know most of you very well. And I know God has a call on everybody's life. He has a ministry for you. He has something for you to do and something for you to be. 
And when you just dilly-dally and take your time and don't trust Him, it's time to repent. That may sound harsh, but look out the window and watch them all dying. Watch them all dying and going to hell. Well, you just do what you feel like doing and not repenting and being what God wants you to be. You know, all the pearls of wisdom and truth he entrusted to you and I. Are you such a miser that you would hoard it from the world? When hands and people are screaming out for truth, give me what you have. And so many churches just shut their door. So many churches might as well just lock their door when they start because nobody's allowed to come in. Nobody's allowed to hear. Nobody's allowed to change. We don't want the power to go out those doors and change people. You might as well just put a little padlock on your heart. When people are dying and going to hell and there's violence and there's hate, the Bible says a kind word turns away wrath. You know how many times I've had people get in my face and swear at me, swear at me, call me names, and I just get right back in their face and say, God has a plan for you. God loves you. I remember one time, you know, big old DOC guy, tats, you know, ready to throw down. God has a plan for you. And you just stop running. <gasps> they start crying. Because a kind word turns away wrath. And truth brings light where there's darkness. You underestimate what God put inside of you. What did God put inside of you? Himself. Himself. He put himself inside of you. And if you belittle that and push it down and pretend like it's not enough, you too like, need to repent. Repent. The church at large needs to repent. People in this nation need to get on their knees and repent. Because right now, God stands there with an axe and He says, I'm ready to cut it down. I'm done. And he says, Jesus ever liveth to make intercession on the right hand of high, And He prays for you and He prays for us. And He prays that you'd move, believe, have faith. Jesus, help my unbelief. I believe, but help my unbelief. This is something that God showed me. Do you think the city of Christ Church and its name is a coincidence? Do you think it's a coincidence that something like this happens in Christ Church? Christ Church. It was named for Christ Church College in Oxford. It was named because they wanted churches to go forth and the gospel to go forth in that town when it was small in the late 1800s. They named it because they wanted God to be glorified. And in 2012, what happens to Christ Church? An earthquake kills 185 people dead in a moment. And seven years later, you have a shooting and 50 people are murdered in Christ Church. What else does God have to say to his church? How much more does he have to shake it to try to get it awake? You're wrong if you think it's a coincidence. You're wrong if you think it's a coincidence that most of the top ten most wicked, most death toll shootings have transpired in our lifetime. They happened in our lifetime. And people get so callous and used to watching it. I was amazed at the news. Two, three days passed and all of a sudden we're talking about what celebrities are wearing. And 50 people are just murdered and they don't care. They just move on. They just move right on. You have the shooting in Orlando. You have all the major shootings. You have people killing people in France. Remember when they came and killed almost 150 people? And we watch it happen around the globe. And God is trying to shake his church because they're asleep in the light. Comfortable. Comfortable in the light. It's not a coincidence. He calls to the Christian to stop playing, stop pretending, and just get right with me. There are so many people in churches that just need to get down on their knees and repent. Say, God, forgive me for being lax. God, forgive me for being lazy. Forgive me for belittling the power that you've put inside of me. The power you put inside of me. You think that he reserved all that power just for 12 disciples? 
You think all those miracles and everything he told them was just for that time? If he did it for them, he'll do it for you. If he did it for them, he'll do it for you. You know how many times I've prayed that when I got into my Bible? You did it for them, you'll do it for me. You're not a respecter of persons. You don't exalt one person above another. It's the same spirit. You did it for him. You did it for her. You'll do it for me. You parted the Red Sea for them. You'll part it for me. You healed that person. You can heal me. You gave truth and light and darkness to that person. You'll do it for me. You gave them a word in season when they needed to speak. You'll do the same for me. And it's no different for you. God is crying out. He's telling his people. He's telling his church, repent. Unless you repent, you likewise will perish. Look at that. Look how evil it is. Look at the wickedness. Look at how it's unchecked. Jesus turns to his disciples and says, Truly the harvest is plentiful and the fields are white to the harvest. Pray the Lord of the harvest that he would send forth laborers into the harvest. That's you. That's you. We don't pray. We don't pray, oh God, if you want... I'll tell people about you. You don't pray those prayers. He already told you. He already told you. God, I pray you send labors in the harvest. And the Holy Spirit's going, that's you, sport. That's you. You are the labor. When you entered into this kingdom and you entered in this family, that was part of your uh, contract. You are a labor. You are a carrier of truth and light and power. And you speak. It's you. You're my servant. You know, the cauldron of this earth is boiling over. You know, there's wickedness and there's evil and there's sinfulness in mankind that knows no bounds. You know, one thing that came to the forefront of my mind, something like this is done in New Zealand where they have strict gun laws and gun violence is very, very small. You know what that tells me? That the wickedness and the sin of man's heart knows no bounds from the ends of the earth. As long as somebody has a heart, they can be wicked. They could be evil. They could be prone to it. You know what the, the hermits and the monks and all the righteous men learned when they tried to go out in the desert and hide in caves and eat beef jerky and be so holy and get away from all temptation? You know what they found out? Sin doesn't understand geography. It's still there. It's Jesus Christ that brings change. It's repentance and it's Aligning yourself with the word that brings change. You know, we see it increasing. One, my favorite pastor and mentor in, in Mesa, Arizona, for many, many years, he said that prophecy is age long. It's absolute and it accelerates. The prophecy and the words of this book are age long. They don't pass away. They're absolutely true and they accelerate. And right now, the foot is on the gas pedal and we're watching it accelerate. It's like a roller coaster. We went up and here we are. And all of us, all of our hair standing back because we're going down and we're watching these things unravel before our very eyes. And we can either sit back with our arms crossed and watch or you can get involved. You can get involved and you bring light where there's darkness. You bring truth. Truth. The greatest commodity on all the earth is truth. And it's found in Jesus Christ. Truth. What? What is, the, what is the epidemic of our age? The truth is up for grabs. It's anybody's opinion. It's however this teenager feels today. That's truth. No. Truth doesn't change. I have two daughters. I know what that's like. You know, I feel this way today. I don't care. The truth is, I said, get your act together. There's consequences. Truth. Truth. And God stands at the door of people's hearts and he knocks and you know that's why this church prays on Wednesday night because God is telling this earth repent 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 and he's telling his church pray 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 these things don't change they don't come to pass unless you pray unless you sacrifice you know what maybe you need to skip a few meals fast pray deny yourself pray that God will do what he said he would do It'll bring to pass what he said that he would bring to pass. It's a call to the church. It's a call to many churches to repent. Get on your knees. Beat on the door that he said would, he would open. Look hard and seek for he said that you would find. 
He said, ask loudly with faith, and if you ask, I'll give it to you. That's what he says in the Word. As I wrote this, I was, we were at men's meeting yesterday, fellowshipping downstairs, and I was joking with one of the brothers, and I said, you know, I'd love to just tell everybody it's your best life now. Health, wealth, and happiness. Just blessings. Show me the money, and it's just all going to rain down, and life's going to be a bed of roses, and we're all going to roller skate right into eternity, arm in arm. Those are not the times we live in. That would be a lie from hell. Because God wants his church to be ready and to be aware. And you're a watchman. You are to watch on the walls. And stand on the walls of your house and watch and listen. And trust him. You know, there is so much hate and violence and the Holy Spirit... This is the crux of the message. God is saying, repent. And he's saying, pray. Pray. Church, if you've never done it before, you need to do it now. You need to pray. You need to pray the Lord of the harvest that he would hold his hand back and he would bring, here comes the R word, prepare yourself, that he would bring revival. That he would bring revival in people's hearts. And you know where revival starts? It starts with one person. It starts with individuals surrendering and bowing their knee and repenting and getting right with him. That's where revival starts. Revival doesn't start in groups. It starts with individuals surrendering and prostrating themselves before the Lord in repentance and tears saying, I'm sorry. You have to change me. And when a group of those kind of people get together, things begin to happen. And hell gets pushed back and darkness gets pushed back. And people begin to change. And then there's power. But we don't have that. The vast majority, it's not there. But God wants a people that cries out for mercy. Mercy for those involved. He wants people that take it seriously. People that cry out. People that repent. This is my last scripture. And I just want you to listen. I just want you to hear this last scripture. These are the scriptures that come before Joel saying, In the last days I'll pour out my spirit. Your sons and daughters, your old men, and I'll do a new thing and a powerful thing. And we love as Pentecostals to quote those kind of verses, don't we? God's going to pour out. Oh, he's going to do something powerful. Dreams and he's going to speak. But what are the verses that come before The verses that come before say, Thus saith the Lord, Turn to me with all your heart, with fasting and weeping and crying and mourning. Tear your heart, tear your clothes, turn to me. I'm gracious, I'm merciful, I'm slow to anger, great in kindness, and I repent of the evil. Who knows if we will turn and repent and leave a blessing behind him? Who knows if he'll turn when we begin to pray? Blow the trumpet in Zion. Sanctify a fast and call a solemn assembly. Gather the people. Sanctify the congregation. Assemble the elders. Gather the children and those little ones and call the bridegroom forth and the bride out of her closet. Get the priests and the ministers of the Lord. Have them cry and weep between the porch and the altar. Let them say, spare your people, Lord. Don't give reproach that all the heathen and all the wicked of the world would look and they would say, where's their God? Those are the verses that come before an outpouring. Those are the verses that come before a move of God. Those are the verses that come before him doing something that can be seen and felt and experienced. We don't quote those ones. But there will be no change in this nation. And there will be no change in the church at large unless we start reading those verses first and acting on them. It's horrible what happened in Christ's church. It's terrible. It's horrifying when we mourn and we cry with them. Just because I don't agree and I think it's absolute 
horrible what Muslims believe and teach. Doesn't mean I wouldn't have a friend that's a Muslim. Doesn't mean I wouldn't go out to eat with them. Doesn't mean I wouldn't come and speak to them about what I believe. Why not? I still love them. I still love them. I'd still lay down my life for them, wouldn't I? There's no greater love than a man lays his life down for somebody. Jesus didn't say there's no greater love that he lays his life down for somebody that loves him more. He said there's no greater love that he lays his life down for a friend. Just a friend. Just a friend. You know, I know it's, it's, a, it's a heavier word this morning. And my, my tendency and my inclination as a pastor is to try to soften the blow. But I'm not gonna. That's what I want to do. I want to come and, but it'll be okay. And you, no. That's what the Lord wanted to say. And if you find yourself in that place of lax, you need to get right so that you can be useful.